So no, I think everybody is here. At least the most important people are here today. Is that correct? <coughs> so now we can do the Sutta class for today. And just to carry on with the theme, and we're going to continue with right stillness. Straight away, I am not sure if you realize that uh, too often when people call samadhi concentration, it did really give the wrong idea. If you haven't seen me do this before, the water in this cup is like your mind. And the goal of this meditation is not to concentrate, but actually to keep the water perfectly still. So, has it become still yet, the water? I think you're the closest, is it still yet? No, okay. And it's quite obvious why, because I'm not being mindful. I'm not even looking at it, I'm looking all over the place. So now I'll be mindful of the water. Has it stopped moving yet? No. I'm not concentrating, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed when you concentrate, I really am concentrating, but it actually moves more. <laughs> but fortunately there's such an easy way of keeping this water perfectly still. You put it down and you wait. Pretty still, eh? That's how to meditate. Meditation is very easy when you know how. You just put everything down. You let go, you detach, you renounce. You stop holding on to things, you stop grasping, you leave things alone. You're patient, you don't do anything. You just wait. It becomes still all by itself. Just like Ajahn Chah used to say, the leaves on a tree, they only move because of the wind. And if the wind stops, the leaves still move, but less and less and less until they become perfectly still all by themselves. You don't have to do anything. That's the amazing thing in this path. You just need to uh, make sure you don't do anything. <laughs> <coughs> when I was flying one place to another, I can't remember where, uh, out of boredom, I must admit, I just picked up the in-flight magazine. And there was an article in the in-flight magazine uh, by one of their pilots just fantasizing about the aircraft of the future, saying that in the aircraft of the future, inside the cockpit, there'd only be two beings allowed. One would be the pilot and the other the dog. <clears throat> so any announcement about, this is your pilot, Captain so-and-so, and also this is my co-pilot, woof, <laughs> that'd be the dog. And the main purpose of the pilot is to make people feel comfortable and safe. But it's only real activity of the pilot is to feed the dog, especially on long haul flights. And the, and the only job of the dog is to bite the pilot if he touches anything. <laughs> In other words, the flight will be fully automatic and much safer. And I kind of like that idea that really when you're meditating, if it was at all possible for me to insert a dog <laughs> between your ears and to bite you if you touch anything or do anything, you'd all get deep meditation enlightened a long time ago. <laughs> no purpose is learning how to renounce, to restrain yourself and to give time enough for this part to actually happen. And to show you how easy it is, this is right stillness, otherwise known as jhana. 
I remember the time when my father was occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, having passed beyond the five senses and free from unwholesome states, I entered ab and abided in the first jhana. This is the bodhisattva remembering. And when he actually was a kid, about six or seven years of age, that was very well known. His father was doing a ploughing ceremony. And a little kid, only six or seven years of age, he passed beyond the five senses and free from unwholesome states. He entered and abided in the first jhana. And at this time when the Buddha remembered this, he thought, could that be the path to enlightenment, Bodhi? Then the realization arose, that jhana is indeed the path to enlightenment. And that's in the Mahasachika Sutta. You may remember the story of the Buddha for years, just uh, trying all sorts of ascetic practices, all sorts of fasting, and staying up all night and doing all sorts of stuff and nothing was producing any results. And he recalled this experience when he was just a kid and said, maybe this is the way to enlightenment. And the realization came, it was. And it doesn't say so here, but in the sutta it says that then the bodhisattva, the person to be the Buddha, started considering it's not easy with a body so emaciated and weak to enter those jhanas. It's not impossible, but it's not easy. What if I started eating, washing, and resting? And after he regained his strength and energy, then we all know what happened next. He went over to uh, Uruwela. That's, uh, was, that's eventually was called Bodhgaya. It wasn't called Bodhgaya yet, because he hadn't been enlightened yet. And so he found a nice tree. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Bodhgaya, but now it's just lots and lots of people, lots and lots of tourists, lots and lots of noise. But in those days, you can imagine, it was a beautiful park on the banks of the River Nerangela. These days, as a Londoner, I would so it's similar to like Kew Gardens, just next to the Thames, beautiful, tranquil and calm, a beautiful park. And that's where the Buddha sat down under a tree and did the jhanas and became fully enlightened. So anyway, this is what are the four jhanas? This is a standard description which occurs so many times in the suttas. Having abandoned the five hindrances. You all know what the five hindrances are? In brief, just wanting, not wanting, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and doubt. Do you know those five hindrances? Do you? <laughs> because that fifth one was always, what, what is doubt? And many years ago, the, you know, after getting some nice meditation, what I did was one of the ways of insight is you know, recording past lives. That's one of the three insights, the Tewija. And the first, so I thought, you know, having got nice peaceful meditation, I asked the question, what is my earliest memory? So I have to remember rebirth. So my earliest memory, I, I've got monastic rules, so I can't go too far back. But the first thing, I was sitting there in a hall in Perth, and then you could feel and understand, relive the time when I was a kid, a baby in my pram. And interestingly, that when I remember this, it comes up straight away, you don't have to force it. This was my earliest memory, and then there's the experience like being back in your pram, years and years and years earlier, and being able to play around in your pram. And one of the things I recall from that experience, 
the most dominant sense was smell. I knew that was my pram because how it smelt. I knew that was my mother because how she smelt. And all the toys, how they smelt. I, you know, I did not do uh, any medicine when I was at university. But then I told that to, to other doctors and they said, that is quite accurate because when a person grows up, the first most dominant smell, which actually develops in the brain, is actually smell. And I told this expert, said, yes, you're right. What do you mean I'm right? I'm the professor, he said. I said, I'm right because I can remember that. You can recall it. But the reason I say this is because even though this was a memory of the past, I had no doubt at all that that was actually me. That was my pram, my toys, my mother. That was a weird thing, the lack of doubt. I never sort of figured it out at the time that you could only have those re recollections of early life, you know, through you know, the hindrances being very weak or totally abandoned. And that's what happened with the doubt, that was abandoned. And to be able to experience something and has a totally different quality to it, you know that is true. I know many other friends have also had those uh, memories of previous lives. Um, I even, I don't know if I told us, did I told the story about that encounter on the London Underground train? <laughs> no. Because Sometimes it's lovely using public transport to go from place to place. I know that some monks only go from place to place in cars, so they actually never meet anybody. So I recall just once uh, going in London on the underground from one place to another, and then somebody came and this woman came and sat next to me. And I remember the conversation, are you a Buddhist monk? I said, yes. A real Buddhist monk? Yes. <laughs> she wanted to have a conversation about Buddhism. It's in the underground train, nothing to do. So I started discussing some uh, things about Buddhism. And one of the things she wanted to know was about reincarnation. I said, well, it just happened on a recent retreat that one of these meditators, you know, he was Italian. Any Italians here? I, ah, oh, Italian. <laughs> yeah, you are sort of, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was Italian, Italian. And he said that during his meditation, he had this kind of experience, but it was very weird. And his experience in deep meditation was that he was a strand of spaghetti. Now, one thing, you must always respect what a person says. You can't laugh at them, not yet anyway. <laughs> and he said he had a similar experience before about being a piece of macaroni. <laughs> so, and I, I got it straight away. He, the experience was recollecting his past lives. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and your response was the response of everybody in that underground carriage in London. <laughs> they all looked up from their iPhones or their whatever they were looking at and they groaned <laughs> and laughed. <laughs> it told me that even though you think they're not paying attention, they are. <laughs> but anyway, that taught me a lot about what doubt is. You know, you experience something, you're not quite sure, especially if it's a bit weird. And that's something I would add also. All the people who think they may have seen a nimitta, a beautiful light in their mind. So many people come up and they ask, was this a nimitta, was this not a nimitta? And you don't need to ask that. 99% of the time it was. That's just anecdotal, that's from experience. You talk to people, you ask them, and in the end, yes it was. Don't doubt. So anyway, after the nimittas uh, come, you go, what usually happens is a person just immerses into that nimitta, or the nimitta sometimes you feel it expanding around you. But what you're left with, having abandoned the five hindrances, totally free from the five senses. 
they were totally free. So you can't hear anything. Of course, you've got your eyes closed. You can't feel anything. If someone touched you on the shoulder, you wouldn't feel it. You can't smell, you can't taste. Touch is gone. The five senses are totally gone. Just like that story I said of um, that uh, gentleman who got into these jhanas by accident and was taken to the hospital. He even had defibrillators, couldn't feel them at all. The electric shocks, couldn't hear anybody. Just really blissed out deep inside. So you can't feel the five senses. Free from the unwholesome states, you enter upon and abide in the first jhana. Wherein the mind moves onto the objects and holds onto it. The object, the meditation object, what you're observing or what you're experiencing at the time, being the joy and pleasure caused by being totally free from the five senses. That's what is the origin of the, uh, the bliss. The five senses are gone for a long time. And that freedom, that separation, where you just got the mind and it's reasonably still, that is the cause of the joy and the pleasure, which is again immense. Yes. And one of the uh, descriptions of the Buddha of that pleasure, he called it Sambodhi Sukha. Pawiweka Sukha was another of the descriptions. But Sambodhi Sukha, Sukha is pleasure, happiness, but very powerful pleasure. And Sambodhi is the word for enlightenment. This was a Buddha calling the feeling in the first jhana, which is pretty constant, however long you're in there, of being the pleasure, the bliss of enlightenment. And say so you're not enlightened yet, but it pretty much feels like it. So close, that's why the Buddha called it enlightenment happiness. And you can do that. Sometimes that just happens. What you're feeling there, whoa, powerful bliss. And that's a bliss of enlightenment. Close enough, said the Buddha. So if you ever want to know what the Buddha felt like, you can. Pretty cool. But in that first jhana, uh, it is not stable. It is stable, but when you're in that jhana, because it's such beautiful bliss, you tend to hold on to it. That holding on to it is the meaning of the term vichara, grabbing onto it. Because they grab onto it, sort of, it moves. You let it go, and then you get attracted to it even more. That's what I call, that's the vichara. So that's the vitaka. The vichara is holding on to it. It disturbs the, the tranquility, you move away, and you get pulled straight back onto it. It's what I've called the wobble of the first jhana. You're blissed out, but it's not stable or still. Stable, it's pretty stable, but it's not perfectly still. Now, when you are in a first jhana, you can't do anything. You're three from the five senses. You can't verbalize. You can't say, this is the first jhana, now I'm going to do this. It's far too still to be able to think, far too still to be able to give any instructions, it's far too still to be able to take notes. A good description of that, or explanation of that, I remember as a kid watching the TV here in UK, and on this quiz show, they had a little um, test for the audience, they'd have something. I remember seeing this pencil, but it was, um, had just a photograph of a pencil, like point on. So I'd look at a little black circle, then a white circle, and then something red on the outside. And you're supposed to be able to, what is this? And it was so difficult to find out what that was. You had to wait till the next week, the next episode of that quiz uh, TV show. Because to really understand something, you've got to see it from this way and that way. You've got to move it around. 
get different perspectives, and that way you can find out what something is. When you only have a still shot from one perspective, it's sometimes hard to understand what it is. And that's the best simile I can give you. Even in the first jhana, you're way too still, you can't move things around, you can't get that much perspective. So a lot of times you don't know where you are, but you're having a wonderful time. But what happens is the experiences in those jhanas are so strong that when you come out afterwards, it's so, so easy to recollect. The only, the nearest thing to describe them with is like the negative powerful experiences called trauma. If you've ever been in an accident, a car crash or fell off a cliff or something, you find that it's like time stops or at least gets distorted and your recollection of that event is very easy. I remember as a student I loved going walking in the highlands of Scotland. It was cheap and it was beautiful. And I remember once losing the path somewhere in the north of, uh, in the northern highlands on the coast and I was alone on this path and as I was walking, sort of I missed the path and I fell off the cliff. And I, I checked it out afterwards, it was easy to do because the grass had grown over the, the small path and there was nothing underneath the grass. And anyway, I remember just had a very heavy backpack on, I twisted around and I was facing this cliff. It went down and down and down, I thought this is it, this is the end of me. And it was a really long drop. I couldn't see how far because I couldn't sort of turn my head and look down. And as I was falling and I felt something solid under my feet, I bent the legs to take the fall and just rolled over. And then I looked up to see how far I dropped. It was only about six foot. <laughs> what happened in, in real danger, like time tends to slow down. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced things like that, but time to slow down so much and I thought it was a very long drop. And of course I was fortunate, I think I tore one a little uh, nail off one of my toes. Other than that I was fine. Could walk to the nearest youth hostel. But I will always remember that. My awareness was so strong that it's like you can't forget it. Like people have accidents in the cars, or traumatic incidents, it stays in your mind. And that's usually the word trauma is reserved for unpleasant experiences. The same thing happens to really pleasant experiences, intense experiences, like in jhana, you can't forget them. So when you come out of a jhana, while you're in there, you can't figure out what that means. But when you come out, what was that? Some of the most brilliant, blissful experiences of your lives. I like saying lives instead of life. And that's where you examine it afterwards. They've got a word for it in Pali, Pacha Awakening and Jnana, the wisdom uh, of uh, reflection, looking back on it. And that's where you find out exactly where you were and what's happening. And also the nice thing is those five hindrances, they disappear for quite a while. Not just the five hindrances, but also what we call arati, which is discontent, and tandi, weariness. If you've ever experienced the jhana, a real jhana, sometimes, sometimes I test you out, see whether it's a jhana or not. And I say that um, Sri Lankan women cannot experience jhana. Sri Lankan men can. <laughs> and see what your reaction is. I'm only prodding you. Of course, Sri Lankan women can get jhanas and, and men can as well. The whole point of me saying that is trying to test you out. What reaction do I get? And if I get a reaction, they say, you know, that's discrimination. You can't say things like that. If I get a reaction out of you, I realize that wasn't a jhana after all. Because in a jhana, when you emerge afterwards, you cannot be upset. People can call you all sorts of stupid names. 
doesn't matter at all. You have this wonderful arati, which is uh, you don't get upset. And the next thing is you don't have any weariness. You know why sometimes people, they can meditate on this retreat and after a while you feel a bit tired? If you get a nice deep meditation, you get this big boost of energy. If any of you got a jhana this afternoon, you would not be able to sleep tonight. You wouldn't want to. It's got a big boost of energy. So that's like the afterglow of these deep meditations. Very sweet, very powerful mind, free of the hindrances. So whatever you want to focus on, it's very easy to see it. The mind doesn't wander backwards and forwards. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't want anything. That means you've got a good chance to see the truth. So after jhanas, we always get the insights. Why do we get those insights? Because the jhana does the job of abandoning the hindrances for long periods of time. Okay, I wanted to say this about, I haven't done all the jhanas yet, but nevertheless, about how the jhanas lead to insight, enlightenment insight. I'm now going to tell you, I think I can tell them, can't I, about when I got enlightened. <laughs> you asked me that earlier, didn't you? Okay, now I'm going to confess. <laughs> If you heard this story before, it's a true story, not a joke. But in my fourth range retreat in Thailand, my meditation was really strong. And I had a monastery, had no hardly any duties, lots of time just to walk and sit and walk and sit. A very simple life. And then one evening, or sometimes you're really hot in meditation. You know, the meditation is so easy, you get so deep. So I was meditating, walking and sitting, and walking and sitting all day. Not because you were putting forth effort, you couldn't do anything else, and mind just wanted to do that. And then I was on the walking path late at night, maybe 11 p.m. or something, and then the mind was so still and so blissed out you get all these great insights started coming in. Amazing insights, answers to some of the deepest questions of the universe. And then I kept on going because it was always incredible fun and joy and bliss. And then, and then the big one came. It was a really powerful insight. And then I thought, another enlightened being has arisen in the world. And it was so blissful, even though it was maybe around midnight, it had no, no sleepiness at all, it just carried on a walking meditation, sitting meditation. And then we used to get up at three o'clock in the morning. So about 2 a.m. I decided to lay down, no way you could go to sleep. So just for half an hour, and after half an hour, went to the hall and carried on meditating, sitting down. And then somebody else rang the bell. I was there already sitting. I never needed to be woken up. And when all the other monks came and we started the chanting, the morning chanting, everyone else was doing the usual, yes, uh, <laughs> And I was going, Yo, so bagawa alahang. I had so much energy. <laughs> I couldn't help it. And then we meditated, and I was blissing out again. Then we went on arms round. And the arms round, as an enlightened being, was very sweet. All these villagers who just gave you a little bit of rice. And I blasted them with loving kindness. You don't know how lucky you are. The first alms food for a newly enlightened monk. <laughs> Zap. <laughs> and I was zapping everybody. <laughs> and then, <laughs> when we got back, usually in those monasteries, we'd usually only have two pots 
actually just one pot of food. It's very simple, very poor monastery. We got the rice on arms around, nothing else. And they usually have the same pots of rotten fish curry. It was rotten fish. If you smelt it, no pladek. Remember that? It smelled terrible. But that's all you had, every day the same thing. But today, there was another pot of food. Now, I used to be a vegetarian before I was a monk, but they don't have vegetarian food there. You no choice, they just hardly had any vegetables. So anyway, the second pot of food. Someone, somewhere, had got this pot of pork curry. It was actually edible. And I straight away I thought, yes, those heavenly beings were also celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> the newly enlightened English monk. <laughs> I did. And in that monastery, I was the second monk there. The head monk, the abbot, he always gets first choice of the food. He was a local boy. He grew up on rotten fish curry and sticky rice. So, you know, on top of his sticky rice, he never took any rotten fish curry. He took about three enormous ladles of this pork curry. It really was greedy. <laughs> but I didn't mind that. There was plenty. I had lots of compassion <laughs> for a few moments. But what he did next, what he did next was unforgivable. <laughs> He took that pork curry, there's still plenty left, he'd already taken his, okay, he never took any rotten fish curry, and he poured the whole lot into the rotten fish curry. And he stirred it all up. <laughs> and he said, it's all the same, it's all the same. After taking his first, <laughs> And I thought, you can't say that. If it was all the same, why didn't you take, uh, uh, why didn't you sort of stir it up and mix it up first before you take yours? And I was very angry. <laughs> but then the anger only lasted a few seconds. And I realized a great insight. Enlightened monks don't get angry. <laughs> And I realise oh, I can't be enlightened after all. <laughs> you know that's very depressing. <laughs> you really think you're enlightened, then you wait. <laughs> and I didn't mind what I ate after that, I just slopped something in and passed it down. <laughs> really depressing. But anyway, <laughs> that was a nice interesting story. <laughs> When I became enlightened, it lasted about, you know, maybe eight hours or something. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling that story. One, it's funny. And number two, be careful. Because you get these incredible mind states of the jhanas. It's not enlightenment. It's a very clear mind. It's, you get a taste of enlightenment. But you need that plus the teachings of the Buddha, the insights to be able to make that like permanent. Anyway, that's the first jhana. In the first jhana, five things are absent, five things are present. When one has entered the first jhana, the five hindrances are totally absent. absent. And what is present is the mind moves on to the objects, holds on to it, the object being joy and pleasure. And there is a one-pointedness, not one, no, it's wrong, a oneness of mind. This word akakata is not just one-pointedness of mind. The word agha means a peak, a summit of perception. And many of you who have been to India know the old town of Agra where the Taj Mahal is, the Red Fort as well. That was the capital of the Mughal Empire in India. It was a capital, a summit, Agra. So Ekagata is a party word for Ekagata, the summit of the mind, a peak of the mind. Not only one pointedness, but incredible one pointedness. And all those things are all together. You don't just, okay, now I'm going to do sukha, now I'm going to do pity, now I'm going to do uh, vitaka, now I'm going to do vichara. This is a natural phenomena. 
it just comes and it's there and when you come out afterwards it has these five qualities but the most important quality is the five senses are totally gone there was one gentleman uh, he was in the, the British Army it's a good old Ron story and uh, British Army but he had terrible migraines he actually came from Yorkshire from well it was yes a hull just down the road from here and uh, the only way to get anything in his life he came from a poor family he joined the British Army to get sort of a profession and he was very diligent he became a, a sergeant in the army and so he was leading whenever he would lead any troops uh, if he had a migraine he'd just find a, a barn or some dark place and sit in there for a quarter of an hour or half an hour and he said he'd just go deep, deep, deep inside where the migraine didn't hit him. And that's how he coped. And he gave me one example. The one day when he was on some exercises in Germany, this was in the 1950s. And then they told her, take her a break for a, a cup of tea. So all his soldiers had a cup of tea, he just found a nice barn and sat inside of it. And then the word came from the commanding officers somewhere, move. So all the other soldiers got in the truck and started driving away and then somebody remembered they forgot their sergeant. So they went back again, they knew which Barney was in and he was happily just uh, sitting quietly and they just picked him up and dumped him in the back of the truck. They'd done that before. And then he, when he opened his eyes, he wasn't in the truck anymore, he, was in the, he wasn't in the, the barn anymore, he was in the truck. He had no recollection at all of being picked up by soldiers and dumped in the truck. I say dumped in the truck because soldiers are not sensitive beings. They just pick you up and they don't do very carefully. They just put you down there. He didn't feel any of that. You know, so that it was the, um, the migraines compelled him to go deep inside where he couldn't feel the pain and that's where he could experience one of the jhanas. Later on, the migraines disappeared. He was very happy for that to disappear, but so did his ability to get into jhana as well. And he was quite regretful. But anyway, that's what it's like being in the first jhana. And now when the mind no longer moves onto the object because it lets go of holding onto it, in other words, you've got enough confidence, you don't need to do anything. Your letting go in the first jhana is almost gone, but not completely. There's a tiny remnant left. When you're confident and you totally let go, then everything becomes very still. What is present is the mind moves on, no. So those, um, vitaka vichara, is, you let go of those things. And you enter upon the bide in the second jhana, which has the trust in the object, the bliss, enough to let go of holding it. And the unity of mind without any movement or holding, with joy and pleasure caused by the absolute stillness. This is a time you're not doing anything, nothing is moving, absolute stillness. It's like samadhija piti sukha, the bliss of stillness. And you say, well, so what? Because it is perfectly still, once you come out afterwards, you will notice that something was missing. In each one of these uh, experiences, never waste the time or too much time trying to recollect what was there. It's much more conducive to real wisdom, to insight, to recollect what was missing. What was usually there, but no longer there. In the first jhana, what was usually there, but no longer there, was your five senses. Now they're gone. Totally gone. Now you've got a, not, a chance of understanding what they were. In the second jhana, what's gone, what's disappeared, is will. Your ability to do anything. Your ability to choose your ability to control anything, that's just not there anymore. And now you have an opportunity, you have the data 
to realize what will is. It's not yours. So anyhow, there's a simile which helps here. It's not from the suttas. Once upon a time, there was a little, as a few uh, Germans here, Karl Kropper. Yeah, you know the Karl Kropper simile. Karl Kropper simile. <laughs> That's a, um, what's it called, tadpole. There was a tadpole which lived in a lake in the, in the monastery grounds in Anukampa's future uh, forest monastery. And the little tadpole, she was really smart. She did very well in tadpole school. She went to the high school and then to university in the lake. And while she was in the university in the lake, she studied especially hydrology. She was an expert in water. And so much of an expert, she did research in water while she was living in the, uh, in the lake. And even out of interest, whenever any Abhidharma experts were in the monastery, she would listen to them discuss well, how the Abhidharma describes water. It doesn't matter with all of that information, can a little tadpole understand what water is? No more than a fish can. A fish has lived its whole life in water, always been in water. You can't really understand what water is. Can you understand what air is? If it suddenly disappears, then you know. <laughs> Same with water. The difference between a fish and a tadpole is that one day a tadpole becomes a frog. So a little tadpole, now a frog, she doesn't know exactly what she's doing, but she jumps. She jumps out of the lake and is there squatting on dry land. Imagine what it must be like for now a frog, the first time out of the water. Now she can understand what water is. That strange stuff, that kind of wet stuff, which is no longer there. At the same time, in that first jhana, when the five senses are totally gone for a long period of time, then you can understand what these five senses are. And in the second jhana, will, it's just not there. It's gone. Sometimes, right now, you may choose not to exercise your will, but you choose to do that. In the second jhana, there is no will. Absolutely gone, vanished. And you're perfectly okay. In fact, actually much more blissed out. Sometimes I use the similes of, the, of being in jail. In jail with these five huge walls. One wall is called sight, the other wall is called sound, smell, taste, and touch. So you can't go outside. And the head warden of the jail, his name is Will. And Will never allows you to be at peace, never allows you to sit down still. Have you ever actually just started meditating and this Will keeps on telling you what to do and giving you suggestions, talking to you, this is not how to do it, do it this way. That Will is always on your back. But then through this Eightfold Path, you learn how to be so still the will can't find you and you disappear. At last, no one is telling you what to do. <coughs> You're free. So when you experience the second jhana, you really are blissed out, You're having a wonderful time. The will is not there. When you come out, it comes back again, but at least you've had some idea of what it's like when there's no will, and you understand what it is. And then, uh, with, the <laughs> with the fading away of joy, you abide mindful and fully aware, experience a bliss purified from joy. It's amazing, isn't it? Purified from joy? The bliss gets even more powerful. The best way of trying to find similes for these jhanas 
It's like I don't know what flavours of ice cream you like. So these are all like ice cream, but more and more delicious flavours. So this is a third, the third genre flavour of ice cream is even more sweet and healthy and juicy than the second genre. And then when that joy vanishes, it becomes the third ice cream. <laughs> It's hard to find similes, okay, so give me a break. And the fourth genre, so then the best flavour of all. And they give a summary of this, having abandoned pleasure and pain, all this fadena, all this experience from the five senses, and the disappearance of joy and unhappiness, the positive and negative from the mind sense. And the only thing left is they call it equanimity. I prefer contentment because equanimity is too bland. Even this is amazing joy and happiness. But I will always add, which has only neutral mental Vedana remaining, just pure mindfulness with contentment. I'm glad the Buddha wrote that because sometimes people th think these are trances. These aren't trances. To other people looking outside, they may think it's a trance, but you're perfectly mindful. And the summit of mindfulness, the pure mindfulness, the perfection of mindfulness, is the fourth jhana. That's when you're really mindful, nothing is disturbing it at all. And what kind of meditation did the Buddha recommend? totally free from the five senses, dot, dot, dot. You abide in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. That's what the Buddha recommended. How does Vipassana fit in? Um, once, again, I, I tell so many stories in different places. If I've told this story here the first day, please interrupt me. About the emperor who had a young son and he wanted to teach the son how to rule. So he sent the son off to a small neighbouring kingdom, so in the edge of his empire. It gave him full authority you know, to learn by trial and error, make mistakes, so his son could learn how to rule in those days when that's the way the government worked. So the son went off to this this far, a far part of the empire. Now, remember when you have children, when you even send them to university. Do they actually do any work the first year at university? Yeah, and of course not. First, the first year away from mum and dad. Freedom! So they party all the time. I still remember this Malaysian girl who came to me just a week before the exam in her first year at university in Western Australia for some chanting. She's doing her exams next week. Can you chant for me, Ajahn Brahm? She said, of course. So I gave her some chanting. I never saw her again, but I saw her friends. And she said her friends were going around saying, Ajahn Brahm's a bad monk. He's a terrible monk. The reason was because she failed. <laughs> My chanting didn't work for her. <laughs> so she blamed me. <laughs> and the friends said, you don't need to feel embarrassed about that, Ajahn Brahm. She's got done no work at all all year. She hasn't been to any lectures, tutorials, she didn't study. She was leaving that part of her visit to Perth in my hands <laughs> while she could party all night. <laughs> That's always what happens, well, not always, but many times. First years away from home, away from mum and dad, a long way away, and the kids mess around and play around. It's first exercise of freedom. So anyway, for this young man, who was uh, the empire's, emperor's son, as soon as he heard that his son wasn't doing any business, was just having fun, he sent his wisest minister to go and teach the son a lesson and encourage him. You've got to govern. You can still enjoy and have the pleasures of being an emperor, but you've got to do the work as well. So he sent the wise minister to the, this uh, kingdom on the edge of the empire, and the wise minister informed the, the, the prince there, 
I've come from your dad to tell you just how and help you how to run this country. You can still have pleasure, but do some work. And the prince said, Nikov, get out of here. I'm the boss here. Get out now before I cut your head off. I'm from your dad. Yeah, I know, but get out. I run this place. So he would not listen to this wise minister. And the wise minister went back to the emperor and the emperor said, yeah, it's my fault. Sorry, I shouldn't have sent you alone. And so he said, return to my son, but take with you one of my fiercest battle-hardened generals in the army. Go together. So he went back to the prince and <laughs> As soon as the prince saw him, he said, I thought I told you to get out of here. And that's when the battle-hardened general took out his own sword and put it to the prince's neck and said, I've also come from your father. Listen to this wise minister. And it's amazing how much focus you can have when you've got a sharp sword held by a fierce general on your throat. I was reminded of that story when Matthias put this thing around. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same. <laughs> I'm listening, I'm listening, said the prince. And with the general holding the sword, then the wise minister could instruct him reasonably, logically. And the prince listened and he agreed. And he became a very good uh, regent in that uh, part of the empire and eventually took over the whole empire. When the Buddha told that story, the wise minister was called Vipassana. The strong general was called Samatha. It allows you to become still, to hold you still enough so you can hear the Dhamma. So that's how they work together. And I'll just, I'm not supposed to anyway, I'll just finish off. There are, this is the Buddha talking, there are, Chunda, that was one of the monks, these four kinds of life devoted to pleasure that are entirely conducive to Nibbida, this repulsion from the things of the world, to fading away, to cessation, to peace, to realization, to enlightenment, to nibbana. These four kinds of life devoted to pleasure. What are they? First jhana, second jhana, <laughs> third jhana, fourth jhana. So, if people of other religions should ask you, they'll say that Buddhists, Buddhists, like Venerable Chanda and me, are addicted to these four forms of pleasure-seeking, they should be told, yes, for they'll be speaking correctly about you. <laughs> We're addicts. <laughs> and the Buddha said they'll be speaking correctly. Then some people might further ask, what benefits can you expect from a life attached to these four forms of pleasure-seeking? What do you get out of being addicted to the jhanas? You should reply that they can expect only four fruits. Only four, not five. Stream winning, once returning, non-returning, or full enlightenment. That's what happens when you get into these deep meditations. Only four, not five, the Buddha said, only four. These are the benefits that you can expect from being attached to these five hindrances? No. Not the five hindrances. <laughs> I was just checking to make sure you were paying attention. Very good, well done, you passed. <laughs> these are the benefits you can expect from being attached to these four forms of pleasure seeking. And one of the reasons I love telling that quote it's because people always used to believe, oh, being a monk, being a nun, that's no pleasure at all. And why do you do that? Just to get up early, early in the morning, 
Just eat whatever somebody puts in your bowl on arms round. And you've got to sit in meditation and talk to people all day. And you don't have any fun. You can't watch any movies. You can't go to any concerts. You can't watch any soccer. You can't do anything. <laughs> what fun is it, being a monk or a nun? Okay, I'm going to really ups no, okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do this. This is my father's joke. When I was young, I didn't even know how to spell Buddhism at that time. He would say, "What fun does a monk have?" None. You said it. What was it? None. What fun does a monk have? None. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Monks have much better fun, and nuns have the same sort of fun. Get deep meditation, enjoy yourself to the max. And of course, if that's what a monk can do and a nun can do, that's what we wish for each one of you. That's why I teach like this. So each one of you can just get into these beautiful states of mind, purity, really a lot of bliss, more than you've ever had in your whole lives for a long time. And so you can come up afterwards and say to Venerable Chandra, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and have such a pure mind, you have the data and the ability to see through this world and also become enlightened. Stream we know once return or whatever. At least one of those. That's why the jhanas are the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path. Always was, we don't add them, just describe how the Buddha taught. S go on. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>